Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, Christine Benz gives us some financial tasks for July. We highlight three stocks that should be on your watch list. Dan Camp tells investors what to consider before buying crypto. And Christine Benz shows retirees how to see if their plans are tough enough to withstand inflation. Let's get started. Here are Christine Benz and Susan Jabinski from Morningstar, Inc. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. July is peak vacation season, but if you find yourself with a bit of free time, Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance, Christine Benz, has some financial jobs that you can tackle this month. Hi, Christine. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Susan. Great to see you. Now, we're halfway through 2021 already, um, and you think that it's a good time for investors to do a little bit of a checking up on their portfolio and their plans mid-year. Where should they start? Well, with the usual things, and there I would say you'd want to put at the top of the list some sort of a wellness check. You'd want to see whether your savings rate is on track given when you hope to retire or if you're already retired, do a little bit of a check on how your spending looks for the year to date. We have seen in, uh, people get out there and begin spending more money recently. Consumers are really eager to get going. So I think it's it's crucial to sort of take a step back and look at whether your overall plan is on track. Start there. Also look at your portfolio's asset allocation. We have gotten off to a pretty good start so far in 2021 in terms of equity market returns. So if you haven't checked up on it recently, check up on whether you might need to do a little bit of adjustment to potentially bring down your equity exposure and add more to safer securities, which haven't performed as well. And then if you have time, I think it also makes sense to take a look at your holdings, make sure that nothing material has changed with your mutual funds or your ETFs, or certainly if you're an individual stock investor, you'd want to check up on the fundamentals of those holdings and make sure that they're still intact and make sure that your overall positioning makes sense given where you are in your proximity to retirement. And you also suggest that investors perform a cost audit at, as part of a mid-year portfolio review. Uh, first, can you just discuss why in particular you think it's important to pay attention to the total investment related costs of your portfolio? Absolutely. We're always evangelizing about the importance of limiting investment related costs, but I would say More now than ever, it really makes sense to take a look at what you're paying in all in investment related fees. And the reason is that when we look at starting bond yields as well as starting equity valuations, they suggest that returns for stocks and bonds over the next decade could be constrained. And so to use a simple example, let's say that you have a a 4% return on a balanced portfolio over the next decade. Well, if you are paying 1% in terms of all in investment costs, you're effectively seeding 25% of your return right there. So I think it makes sense to be very parsimonious about what you're paying in investment related fees, particularly given that returns may not be so great in the future. Now, if an investor does want to do a cost audit of his or her portfolio, what what should be on their dashboard? Well, certainly taking a good look at the investment-related costs that you're paying. This is one reason we've seen these tremendously strong flows going to very inexpensive index funds and exchange-traded funds because investors recognize the role that costs play in their take-home returns. So start with your... uh, investment costs. You can find a view of what you're paying in terms of your asset-weighted expenses. If you use the x-ray feature of Morningstar.com's portfolio manager, also take a look at what you're paying in advisory fees. Oftentimes, the fees that investors pay to their advisors are money are money well spent. The uh, advisor can help keep you in your seat in those periods of market duress. But make sure that you're not paying for advice that you're not necessarily using. Uh, So take a look at your advisory fees as well as part of this cost audit. Uh, Another part of a mid-year portfolio review that you suggest is conducting a tax audit. Uh, Why is this important and what would it involve? 
Right. In a similar vein, you know, you, you look at your before tax, before expense return. Well, that gets reduced by fund expenses, by tax costs. So it makes sense to take a look at what you're paying in taxes. And I would split this into really two categories. One would be to, to make sure that you are making the maximum allowable contributions, or at least as much as you can swing, into the various tax advantage receptacles that you have available to you. So that might be some sort of company retirement plan. It might be an IRA. Health savings accounts might be available if you are covered by a high deductible plan plan. Very high income investors may find that they have even more to invest in there. You may want to see if your plan, your company retirement plan offers what are called after tax contributions. So make sure that you're fully funding and fully taking advantage of all those tax advantaged savings receptacles. If you're saving for college, look at 529s. And then within your non-retirement, non-tax advantaged accounts, do a quick look at those to make sure that you are investing as tax efficiently there as you possibly can. So this is another feather in the cap of exchange traded funds and index funds. They tend to be very tax efficient, at least equity ETFs and index funds. If you're a higher income person you and have fixed income assets in your portfolio, you may also want to look at municipal bonds. So take a look at that portion of your portfolio. You're 2020 tax return may be a good guide to where you may be able to make some adjustments to make your portfolio more tax efficient going forward. Just bear in mind, though, that in order to engineer some of these tax efficient maneuverings, you may trigger some other taxes. So get some tax advice unless you're completely comfortable with tax related matters. So, Christine, we've been hearing about some proposed tax law changes that could have implications for investors. Is there anything they should be thinking about or doing preemptively? Well, if you have highly appreciated positions in a taxable account, I do think it's a good time to get some tax advice about how to proceed. Uh, It sounds like the the changes under consideration, which would involve a higher capital gains rate on the highest income investors, as well as potentially a little bit of a curtailment of the step up in cost basis that's currently available for inherited assets. Those would be the two main changes. So get some tax advice if you have highly appreciated positions in your taxable account and think that you may be vulnerable to some of these changes. It may be that if you take a close look at the situation, those highly appreciated positions are also adding risk to your portfolio. They're they're skewing your portfolio heavily to perhaps company stock. So I do think it's a good t- good time, especially considering where we are in the market cycle, to consider whether you could potentially reduce your overweighted positions and do so in a tax efficient manner, perhaps in a series of sales over a series of years. There may also be a role for charitable giving in relation to those positions. So it is a good juncture to get some tax advice in light of the potential tax changes, as well as in light of the fact that we have had such a long running rally in equities. Well, Christine, thanks so much for giving us something to do in July. If we didn't have something to do, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. Expand your investing horizons and look to the long term with Morningstar's podcast, The Long View. Join hosts Christine Benz and Jeff Patak as they talk to influential leaders in investing, advice, and personal finance. Search for and subscribe to The Long View today. Now, here's why we think Clorox, Coca-Cola, and Colgate Palmolive are great companies. Everyone defines a great company differently. Here at Morningstar, we think great companies are those that have a few traits. First, they've carved out significant competitive advantages that should allow them to thrive for decades to come. Next, they boast reliable cash flows. And lastly, they're run by managers who are adept at allocating capital. Today, we're looking at three names that fit the bill. They may not all be undervalued today, but they're great watch list candidates. The first is Clorox. With a history dating back more than 100 years, Clorox now sells a variety of consumer staples products, including cleaning supplies, 
laundry care, trash bags, cat litter, charcoal, food dressings, water filtration products, and natural personal care products. Beyond its namesake brand, the firm's portfolio includes Liquid Plumber, Pine Sol, SOS, Tylex, Kingsford, Glad, and Hidden Valley, among others. Even though it faces competition from private label offerings, Around 80% of Clorox's U.S. sales are from brands that are number one or two in their categories. Clorox continually looks to strengthen its brands, emphasizing innovation and marketing to differentiate its fare. We think shares are worth $171 each. Next, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is the largest non-alcoholic beverage entity in the world, owning and marketing some of the leading carbonated beverage brands, such as Coke, Fanta, and Sprite, as well as non-sparkling brands, such as Minute Maid and Georgia Coffee. Coke's brand resonance in the non-alcoholic beverage category has been going strong for over 130 years, and we see structural dynamics that will ensure this persists. Despite competing in a mature industry, the firm is adequately exposed, either directly or indirectly, to growth vectors, such as premium water and energy drinks. Moreover, we believe Coke will be able to continue extracting incremental value growth from the carbonated soft drink market. We think shares are worth $55 a piece. Last, there's Colgate-Palmolive. Since its founding in 1806, Colgate-Palmolive has grown to become a leading global consumer product company. In addition to its namesake Oral Care line, the firm manufactures shampoos, shower gels, deodorants, and home care products that are sold in over 200 countries around the world. The firm's focus on the oral care category, which has been characterized by a higher degree of customer loyalty, has helped it build a sustainable advantage around the Colgate brand. In fact, the firm maintains more than nearly 40% worldwide market share in toothpaste. We think shares are worth $72 each. Next, here are Dan Kemp from Morningstar Investment Management and Holly Black from Morningstar UK. Welcome to Morningstar. I'm Holly Black. With me is Dan Kemp from Morningstar Investment Management. Hello. Hello, Holly. So, Dan Kemp, the world is going crazy for crypto. What is driving all this interest? Well, there's so much driving it at the moment, as, as we know. You can't have a conversation with people in the investment world at the moment without it turning to crypto pretty quickly. And I think it's important to divide up the drivers between the uh, initial drivers and the things that are now keeping the interest going. So the initial drivers uh, were a combination of uh, a new technology, the, the blockchain and, and bitcoins uh, uh, originally, and then obviously other cryptocurrencies and, and tokens along the way, uh, and also concerns about uh, fiat currency, uh, paper money and electronic money and the, uh, the actions of central banks and then uh, low interest rates uh, and the fact that people are looking for returns in unusual places. That's what seemed to get uh, cryptocurrencies going. What's happened since then, of course, is that people appear to be making fortunes in cryptocurrency. And of course, that then uh, creates momentum as more and more people get pulled in in the belief of uh, very fast, very easy riches to be had. And so that's creating an incredible amount of Bitcoin, uh, uh, incredible amount momentum and also interest around the asset class. Well, that's it. Some people have seemingly become overnight millionaires. And um, the question is whether that can continue. So obviously, you think about valuation first. How do you think about that with something like cryptocurrency that's all a bit new and difficult to judge? Well, the first thing to remember is that uh, these stories of overnight riches are nothing new. Uh, we've seen many occasions in the past uh, when these sudden enthusiasms have led to incredible increases in the price of a particular asset, uh, be it a uh, tulips or uh, South Sea stock or uh, rail companies or all sorts of different things where there's been this incredible enthusiasm about one particular asset class. It's 
typically been accompanied by a change in technology and low interest rates. Uh, and what we see is because the price rises so quickly that people become very wealthy overnight. The, the question is whether people can hang on to that wealth. And, and that's dependent on, on two things. The, the first is the underlying quality of the asset, but also the distance between what is a fair value of a particular asset and what the price is. The greater the difference between the fair value and the asset, the higher the likelihood that people can lose money or even worse, uh, get sucked in at the top of a market uh, before it falls. And, and we have to learn these lessons of the past. We're thinking about any new investment, not just cryptocurrency, but anything new and popular that comes along. So here's the key question, Dan. Does crypto have a place in my investment portfolio? Well, Holly, I cannot comment on your investment portfolio, but I think most investors need to be very careful about including cryptocurrency in their portfolio for, for any number of reasons. The first thing is that I'm using a generic term, cryptocurrency, which covers a huge number of actual different types of coins and, and different tokens and different technology. So first of all, you have to know what it is that you're buying. And then second, when you've established what it is that you're buying, uh, think about why it has a value. Uh, some things appear to have a value just because they're popular. But as with all fashions, that popularity can disappear overnight. Uh, and suddenly you find the thing that you thought had value doesn't really. And so really understand why it is that something has any value at all, but then secondly, why it's uh, as valuable as it appears to be at the moment. And then once you've been through that process, then there may be a case for having some diversifying uh, assets in your portfolio, uh, which don't act in the normal way of stocks and bonds. But remember, the point of a diversifying asset is something that uh, preserves wealth uh, when traditional assets are falling in value. Uh, it, the purpose of a diversifying asset is not to try and make uh, overnight fortunes. That's not how investment works over the long term. And so I would be very, very careful about holding crypto assets in your portfolio. Uh, make sure that you understand the risk that it conveys. And remember that investing is really very boring. Uh, it's about uh, making long term decisions based on valuation and spreading your risk. And that never changes. Dan, thank you so much for your time. For Morningstar, I'm Holly Black. Lastly, Christine Benz explains how to test the strength of your retirement plan and portfolio. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar. Consumers are seeing signs of inflation, which might strike fear into the hearts of some retirees who lived through the very high inflation rates of the 1970s and 1980s. Joining me to discuss how to assess how inflation tough your retirement portfolio and plan are is Christine Benz, Christine's Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance. Hi, Christine. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Susan. It's great to see you. So how big of a concern is inflation right now? Should we start worrying? Well, you know, there have certainly been some worrisome headlines. We had a uh, much higher inflation reading for the month of April than was expected, and I think that ha that has some consumers worried. We've seen the market appear to be a little bit worried about inflation. We've seen bond yields ticking up. Uh, the big thing that economists seem really puzzled by is that they're not sure whether this is just sort of a short-term phenomenon associated with the reopening of the economy, with fuller vaccinations, kind of the pent-up demand uh, that is out there, and whether it will go back to more normal levels going forward. So I would say it's very much in the category of watch this space. I don't think it's a hair on fire, worry about inflation moment just yet. But certainly we all have gotten very accustomed to be to inflation being very, very low. It may not always be the case. So I think it's worth keeping on your dashboard, especially if you're someone who is retired and in part living on your portfolio. So if a retiree is concerned about inflation, how can he or she go about sussing out how big of a threat it might be for them? It's a really good question. I would say take a close look at your spending. The tricky part is that 
spending over the past year was pretty anomalous relative to what it's likely to be in the years ahead because we had so much constraint in terms of what we could do in terms of travel and restaurants and all the things that constitute quality of life, especially in, for, in retirement. But do start taking stock of your spending. Think about the categories where the biggest parts of your budget go. The good news for retirees is that some of the categories where we've been seeing high inflation lately um, do not affect them as much as the general population. So energy prices we've seen have been going higher Retirees in aggregate tend not to spend as much on energy. They tend, tend to not be commuting, for one thing. And so that's less of a drag on their budgets. On the other hand, healthcare inflation, at least historically, has been running higher than the general inflation rate. That's a category where retirees do tend to spend more than the general population. So spend some time looking back on your spending over the past year or two. Think about the categories where you're spending and take a look at whether the inflation is trending up or down in those areas. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics does uh, publish a really nice granular view of where inflation has been heading up or down. Compare that to your own spending categories. Do you think it's also important to take a look at your in-retirement income sources, specifically looking f to find out if any of them offer you some inflation protection or an ability to keep up with inflation? Yeah, I think that's such a valuable exercise. And I really think of retirees as being on a spectrum here. So um, so in sort of the perfect inflation, inflation hedged category would be a retiree who's lucky enough to retire with a full pension that's providing most of his or her income needs or all of his or her income needs and is inflation adjustment and adjusted. The problem is such pensions are really pretty rare today, mostly just in the public sector do we see those sorts of pensions, but that's someone who's sort of perfectly protected against inflation. At the other end of the spectrum would be the, someone who is relying exclusively on his or her portfolio to meet income needs in retirement, and they're hunkered down in very safe investments that don't provide any insulation against inflation. That person is very, very vulnerable to inflation. Most of us will land somewhere between those two poles. So for most retirees, they're getting a portion of their income needs from Social Security, which is inflation adjusted, but they're also pulling additional living expenses from their portfolio, which is not inherently inflation adjusted. So take stock of that, see where you fall on that spectrum. So Christine, what about at the portfolio level? Let's say someone is tapping into that portfolio as a retiree for retirement income. Are there particular asset classes that will do a better job of helping insulate them against inflation? Definitely. So when we think of fixed income assets, your best ally there is to use some sort of treasury inflation protected securities, professionally managed asset allocations from, say, our colleagues at Morningstar Investment Management would typically include 20 to 30 percent of the fixed income portfolio in treasury inflation protected securities for people who are retired. And then you might think of some ancillary fixed income assets around the margins of your fixed income portfolio. So high yield bonds or bank loans, for example, that's the fixed income piece. On the equity side, I think a key thing to keep in mind is that even though equities are not a hedge against inflation, so if inflation goes up 3%, your equity portfolio won't necessarily go up 3% too. Equities have historically generated better returns than inflation. And that's one reason why I would argue that retirees, even conservative ones, should maintain ample exposure to stocks in their portfolios, even in retirement, because that does provide some cushion against inflation. And you've been a little bit less enthusiastic traditionally about some of the categories that investors might think of when it comes uh, comes to inflation protection, like real estate or commodities. Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that it's really hard to get the timing right on these assets. Um, you might maintain ongoing positions in them, but investors sometimes give up on them at the worst possible time. 
Um, so that is a key reason. And the other thing um, with commodities is just they're extraordinarily volatile. And so even though they have um, tended to be pretty positively correlated with inflation, many investors just have a hard time sticking with them. So those would be a few of the key reasons that I would be less optimistic about including those categories. Another thing to keep in mind is that they are not as encompassing as CPI. So real estate investments have historically had some correlation with inflation, some utility as inflation hedges, but they're really just encompassing a broad, a, a narrow segment of the market. So they're not uh, as broad-based as, say, the uh, inflation adjustment that you would receive with a Treasury inflation protected security. And then lastly, Christine, what about the idea of adding inflation protection if you're someone who's purchasing an insurance product? So what if you have an option to add a rider for your long-term care policy? Is this something that investors should be thinking about in retirement? Well, it certainly sounds attractive, especially as we're all more worried about inflation. The key thing I would keep in mind, though, is that the pricing for the inflation protection tends to swing around a little bit. And we were recently interviewing an expert on annuities for our podcast, and his point was just that the inflation protection for annuities had just gone through the roof in terms of adding it, that it was prohibitively expensive and that uh, retirees might reasonably just sort of accept that risk because the price of adding that inflation insulation was just extremely high. So we will tend to see that variability. Unfortunately, you'll tend to see the pricing on such features go higher when inflation is very much top of mind for consumers as it is today. So it'll kind of ebb and ebb and flow. Right now, my fear is that such inflation protection is pretty expensive. Well, Christine, thank you so much for your perspective today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services, LLC, is a subsidiary of Morningstar, Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.